One of the fascinating things about audiovisual translation, and indeed something that I very much wanted to explore and, and capture in the initial chapter of, of the book, is the extent to which audiovisual translation has evolved and developed from the time when it was first conceived. And uh, obviously it goes without saying that uh, audiovisual translation uh, is a form of mediation that dates back to um, the origins of film and that was originally um, conceived to facilitate the international distribution of a very specific text type um, of films on motion pictures and, and, and therefore uh, the set of conventions that was originally developed is very much informed by uh, what was the main priority in the agenda at the time. Uh, but uh, as the decades have passed and uh, as, as we have witnessed uh, the, 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 the emergence of new forms of, of mass entertainment like television and then other forms of screen-based texts like video games, to give one example, um, audiovisual translation has had to adapt to this increasingly heterogeneous uh, range of texts and the needs and demands of these new audiovisual genres. And therefore, I'm uh, entitling, I'm calling this first chapter Mapping an Evolving Conceptual Network, because that is what um, practitioners and scholars of audiovisual translation have had to do over uh, the best part of the 20th century, and now even faster, um, during uh, the 21st century so far. I have structured this chapter around three main sections. In the first of these big sections, I discuss in detail this issue of the widening remit of audiovisual translation. There are more and more texts that uh, need translation. Uh, we as practitioners and scholars are setting ourselves more and more important challenges, so we are no longer uh, happy with um, uh, thinking only about what we can do in terms of uh, language mediation, but we are also more concerned about uh, what, what is being communicated through other forms of uh, meaning-making resources and the impact that this has on the translation. And of course there are more and more scenarios in which uh, audiovisual translation is beginning to feature very prominently. So uh, this process of evolution uh, is one that is very well illustrated by the extent to which different authors have chosen different terms to designate this area of study. But one of the points I want to make in relation to this first issue is that even though this is a very complex and very sophisticated form of linguistic mediation, uh, society at large and even scholars working in neighboring disciplines such as film studies still fail to grasp that complexity, the sophistication of, of what audiovisual translators do which clearly indicates that we as a community have uh, been quite bad at communicating where uh, the, the idiosyncrasy, uh, the, the sophistication, the complexity lies. In the second of the sections that I include in this chapter, I look at the different varieties of audiovisual translation. I uh, did not mean this to be a comprehensive overview because there are many already out there in the field, but I certainly wanted to make sure that I covered a number of issues in relation to each type of audiovisual translation that will help readers to then make full sense of um, uh, later chapters in the book where I talk about theoretical uh, frameworks or, or research methods used in audiovisual translation to give but 
a couple of examples. So um, I look, uh, broadly speaking, at subtitling, then I move on to revoicing, under which I uh, consider uh, um, lip synchronized dubbing, voiceover, narration, um, free commentary, and uh, simultaneous interpreting. And then what I call assistive forms of audiovisual translation, such as subtitling for the hard of hearing, speaking, and audio description, which um, aim to cater for the needs of sensory impaired audiences. So in addition to um, clear explanations of what each of these modalities involves, I also focus specifically on the latest developments in relation to each of those modalities and try to outline what uh, the next challenges and um, the prospects of innovation um, are and can be found. The third and final section has to do with the academization and institutionalization of audiovisual translation, two very uh, difficult words to pronounce, both of them nominalizations. So um, by academization I uh, mean the following. Um, what is the role that um, uh, audiovisual translation has played within the wider field of translation studies. How have uh, translation scholars uh, described audiovisual translation, uh, placed it within the wider map of translation studies? Uh, to what extent have they regarded audiovisual translation uh, as, as a form of translation subordinated to others or um, uh, um, quite the opposite, to what extent have they foregrounded the idiosyncrasy and specificity of this form of translation. So this is something that I uh, deal with by looking at some classifications of uh, translation studies that have been proposed over the years. And then by institutionalization I describe basically um, the process whereby audiovisual translation has achieved increasing visibility and a wider presence in uh, uh, higher education institutions and therefore receive the social recognition uh, that this entails. Ultimately, um, this chapter helps us understand how uh, fast audiovisual translation has grown and I have a what I think is an interesting example towards the end where I show how um, only in 1989, for example, De La Batista uh, was referring to audiovisual translation as a virgin area of research. And 20 years later, the Adventist refers to audiovisual translation as a field that has now developed its own theoretical and methodological approaches. So how could that happen so fast? And has it really happened to that extent are two questions that I hope this chapter uh, will shed some light on.